This is where the real challenge comes is a piece like this. I tried to do a, you know, a light in a dark side or something, you know, or where there's some actual, you know, bark and then no bark. But I hollowed this out. To get this to line up, the real trick is a thin parting tool. And so Don Grimes, he gave this to me years ago. This is a piece of bandsaw blade. It used to be about this long, but I've used it, I've been just parted all kinds of stuff with it, and it works great. It's a 32nd of an inch wide, and the thing is, if you sharpen it, and you put sharpen this edge here on the bottom, it puts a burr on the top. It cuts slicker than anything you've ever seen before. I mean, it goes right down, and it's a 32nd of an inch thick. It's great, but I can't go very deep with it now. So, talking with him about, uh, I got another piece of the, uh, bandsaw blade and made a parting tool. I thought, so it doesn't grind off all the way or so quickly, why don't I heat treat it? And so I did. There's another piece of it I was going to show what I did with this. Got a uh, big propane torch that we use to burn off our pasture. You know, I mean, this is, goes up to a 20 pound bottle and everything is great big. It's about three feet long, about that big on the end. Anyway, this is thin enough. You stick that in there, and it brings it up to temperature, as you can see here by the color, pretty quickly. And I had uh, seen on YouTube or somewhere, you take a magnet, and you put, I mean, you can tell by the color, you know, when it gets to be not cherry red, but, you know, kind of a dull red, it reaches critical temperature and then it becomes non-magnetic. That's one way you can tell. I had one of those expandable I don't, uh, little magnet things when you drop something down in a crevice, you know, you can stick that down and pick it up. Anyway, I was doing that with it as I was heating this, and you could tell how, you know, the magnet sticks to it, and then all of a sudden, nothing at all. Quenched it in, I think I had 530, or motor oil. Anyway, quenched it in that, and this is great because you put a file to this and everything, it just skates right across it. Down here, it digs right in. So anyway, these are great because you don't have to sharpen them as often and it, it works real well. So anyway, I put it in a little handle and uh, they work great. I made the handle a little bit longer here because usually when I'm you know, parting something off, I have my other hand here and I'm going in with one hand. and Having it a little longer makes it a lot easier to control. And that's why it's kind of a square shape too. I can't think of an example or a time when you need to twist a parting tool in. So anyway, I thought it was easier to help me register to keep it square or, you know, when it's square. So I did that. Um, here's a piece of that blade grind the teeth off. This is seven-eighths of an inch, and it works out real well. Now, okay, I'm going to tell you, I ripped off, Kevin got a piece of this too and was playing with it and said uh, he thought he could come up with a way to make this adjustable so that you wouldn't, for example, yep, use this much of it and then waste all the rest of this. So he came, I tried three different ways to come up with uh, a design, and I couldn't come up with anything better than the way Kevin did it. What he did is this, goes right in here. Double stick tape, folks, works great. Put a piece right in here, put your blade in, and again, it's not that often you're gonna be need, need to adjust this. Double stick tape here, put these together, and uh, you're good to go for quite a while until you, you know, you grind it down. I haven't ever used it like that before. That would be kind of wild, but anyway. Yeah. So, thank you, Don Grimes, because you're the one who started this whole damn thing over three years ago, and it's taken on kind of a life of its own. Not just thin parting tools, mind you, but I got on Amazon, eBay, and found high-speed steel. Nice pieces of it. 
three millimeters thick. Actually, this is two millimeters by 20. This is three by 18. Um, real easy to make parting tools there. Next to impossible to drill holes in. That's why rivets are way down here for the scales on the handle because I tried and, on one of these, there's a lot of holes. I tried and tried and tried. I ruined, I don't know how many bits, you know, drill bits trying to drill that out. Couldn't do it. So what I did was scallop the, just ground, <laughs> big grooves and everything in here so that uh, they go in here like this. I have a bunch of uh, holes that I drilled. I epoxy this, and epoxying these in works real well. I don't know if you guys can see this, but. And then have the epoxy seep into the holes and everything on all around the, uh, the scallop portion of these blades so that they're not going to come apart. So anyway, that's, I did this so you know what the inside of these look like. But it uh, works so, real well. So, Mike, you, you're only going to really need one of those. So what are you going to do with the rest? Sell them. Okay. Give them away. Whoever needs them kind of thing. They're fun to make. The thing is, it's like setting up for any of these handles and everything. Once you have your table saw set up to cut one, it's just as easy to cut ten. I mean, really. It's if you got the material, it's no problem running it through. So that's what I did. Okay. And the problem was... Where do you get more of this material? Don had, I don't know, a, a big 15-foot industrial bandsaw blade. I don't know where you can get this. I mean, I've looked all over, this is all over eBay and Amazon and everything else. The thinnest I can find is two millimeter. Like I say, this, I uh, measured the, it's a 32nd of an inch. And this is, this is perfect. It's wide enough, too, that provides stability, you know, or beam so you can press in with it. But uh, anyway, it's been fun making these, and if anyone's interested in more information about them, see me, and uh, I'll probably have, you know, some of these for sale here before too long. So anyway, oh, that's my story. Okay. I know there's a lot of other people that have homemade tools that hopefully they brought tonight and can share with us. Um, yes, sir. How many people? Oh, we don't know. Okay. <laughs> don't know. With a razor, how many have something to show and tell with this demo to tonight? Okay. Okay, so I've gone way over. Five, about five minutes a person. Great. <laughs> it's fun. I like talking about it. Okay. Hi. Right. My name is Jack White, and I'm a new member here. This is my second meeting to come through, but I brought in my uh, homemade. My, my homemade. Can you please use oh. that stand oh. over there. Yep. <laughs> Is this, does this thing spin? Does yep. this spin? That's a good thing right there. Yeah, okay. Aha. There we go. All right. Okay. So I'm going to hold this, and hopefully you can see there's a, I, uh, I took a grinder, and I ground a chunk out of the flat plugins for the screwdriver that I got at a garage sale. There we go. There we go. Am I? Hello, hello, hello. There we go. Anyway, so garage sale screwdriver, okay? Um, took a grinder, ground out a chunk out of the tip, sharpened it on several sides, and it makes a wonderful uh, captive ring tool for five bucks and ten minutes of grinding. All right?
about two years ago, I attended a class with Paul Fennell. And if you know his work, he does mostly hollow forms. What he makes and sells is this item. So it's a distance finder or a thickness finder for your hollow form where you can't get quite underneath the very small opening that you're going through. So what you do is flip it into the inner part of the very top. This section moves. So as you get into the hollow form, you can then get the first group you can and you measure it down here. Be it real thin to the knife, I'll leave it out on the table so you can see. Well, I figured, I need it a little farther to go. So I then made a mesh router. Use this pickaxe to put it in. You want to go down another inch, or another two inches, or another four inches to measure the thickness of the wall. Get in there, you measure it the same way down in here. Once you got it there, now you, now you can eyeball it or you can measure it with a ruler, whatever you want to do. But it's all stuff that you can get. It's a block of wood is uh, off of a, another piece, probably a thousand dollar piece of wood. Um, if you believe that, I've got a ton of these to show you. And uh, these are all just, I tried it out at home once at first, uh, but the inner material sort of bends, so this was just off of a roll of wire that you can buy at Target. So these are easy to make. I took Jerry Darter's yo-yo class, but it didn't work very well. I couldn't find the string. He forgot to tell me you had to have a string to make a yo-yo. Thanks, Jerry. I really appreciate that. Actually, what this is, is it's a uh, one form of doing in and inside outside turnings to hold the turning. You'll be able to hear me.
waiting for you to go away and have a hot shower and come down and visit me. I said, I can't do that. So the kids were playing in the pool and we decided to walk around the pond and get some sun and all that. Walk into the pool and the white water was already drifting and there was some mud and grime on it. So I got out there and I said, I agree to the covenant. Then God told me that I have to make sure that the kids and the children in there are just right when they leave the church. Thank you for that. got this idea on uh, YouTube from a guy named Jerry and Jerry Carlin and a couple other guys that this is basically a Christian club for mothers and fathers and they all say that the kids come and get fed on the way. The reason for it is because they're cutting uh, oil blocks, cutting them uh, with the chip out, uh, out of the wood This is a brass one that you can cut and you can uh, save some uh, machine shop work. And then you can blow the hole and the bigger brass one will go in there. And then you've got this one that's only about two inches long. But this whole song is on machine shop work because this was soldered down on the blade. And so the, uh, the machine on the, on the machine shop work. So all that I have to do Thank you. 
Um, I've just been doing tools for a little while, so um, this is actually the first tool I did, and somebody else talked about a um, captive ring, and this was to get in there. Um, very crude. It's, it's only glued into the handle, so it's, um, it's the first tool I ever did. Um, this one, um, over the holidays, I was turning bells, and I've done a little, started doing a little bit of hollowing, and so if you set the tool rest here, um, and, you, and you start the center on there, you can just push this in. So it saves you from setting up your chuck and going in. And um, when you're just trying to get a hole to start in the depth, instead of using a Faustner bit, it goes really slow. This thing will go very fast because it's meant to take out the wood. But um, because it's going faster, you're not going to get the smooth cut you would if you had the Faustner bit. Um, and then... Um, I was trying something out, which um, I, I may be doing a demo on later, but um, uh, Chris Coyne was in turning um, a cube into a, a, a feature. And so I really had made a handle for this, although I have a tool I could stick it in, but it's just a very fine point tool. So you can use this to make your little goo on something, but also um, we had wings going in very tight angle and you can't get the uh, spindle gouge into it so you can get this in here and you can turn it a little bit to scrape it and clean out any tool marks on the way out um, and again it, it was a flat piece of um, um, I don't know I think it's a 4 by 4 by 200 millimeters so it's a very small piece um, it's ground to be very um, narrow so the angle here is probably about 20 inches so or 20 degrees, so you can get really in a tight area that you can't get in with the spindle gouge. And then the last thing um, that I was working on, and um, it's a little bit nicer handle, but I'm still experimenting on it, but um, particularly um, I'd taken a class with uh, Ashley a few years ago. She liked doing the expansion um, um, jaws, using the outside of the jaws and expanding them, and then the demo last month with Anthony, same thing. And, it, you know, if, if you have a skew and you're trying to do that, well, the headstock is in your way. So you either have to do something so you can move the headstock out of the way. So I, I basically ground this tool so that um, you can come in at from the side of the headstock and then it's, it's ground so that the, it angles flat here and then has your dovetail come in here so that um, once you use something to create your little path there. You can clean it, straighten it out with the end of there, and then create a little dovetail coming in um, so that when you expand the jaws, you got a little bit of dovetail there. I'm hoping everybody understands what I'm talking about. Um, and this one, um, I actually made a handle, and I've got a little um, set screw in there. So this is my first time doing a set screw on a handle. Um, I think I have to redo it, but it's, it's a good starting point. So.
my uh, my bolts aren't quite long enough, so when I'm turning, they vibrate off. And so somewhere in the bottom on the floor of my shop, or dad's shop, there's a there's a carriage bolt and wing nut. Another wing nut. Um, I didn't try to find it. I'm the master of wimpy uh, wimpy spigots. So my spigots are too small, and so instead of making bigger spigots, I uh, I came up with these things, and it's monkey see, monkey do. There's a, a really slick three or $400 device like this that you can buy um, made out of metal, and on YouTube, which is a wood turner's best friend, uh, somebody came up with a device like this out of wood. So I just took the concept and uh, uh, adapted it for my own use. It's made out of plywood, and I've got these nifty little slides back in here just for uh, the different diameters and the wheels for the for the big one are, uh, are just the uh, roller blade wheels and they're really dirt cheap oh, there goes another bolt yep roller blade wheels and then this one is just a smaller version of the same thing and, uh, you know, if you go, uh, I, when I was doing my scoping for supplies, I started looking for these little bearings at places like Ace Hardware, and it's like five bucks a bearing. And I got wise. Once I found the rollerblade wheels, I, you know, I got the bearings, and the bearings are cheap. So these are the bearings that Fred used those. And um, for somebody that doesn't have quite the light touch, it pushes too hard, maybe doesn't get his toes quite as, as uh, sharp as it need be, need be it's a real lifesaver. So, uh, uh, especially when doing like long, spindly things or bowls that have like a long shape. Uh, I like turning in flurry. I haven't turned one in a while, but uh, when you turn stuff like you know in flurry pot, it really makes makes things so much easier. So, that's what I've got. This will go fast. This will go fast because uh, I only have one. I did make the first tool I ever made was a captive ring tool that I ground a three-sided file into a little hook, and it worked for quite well. I um, was setting in with the Knights of the Square Table in there on Saturday and um, talking about how we can, if I could use these old planer blades to make a tool and they're high speed steel they said yes and the only tool I could think of that I needed was like Jack had where it's to cut the little angle for for a dovetail an inside dovetail so I just ground it put a uh, pretty aggressive edge on it and then built a handle around it I've used it a couple times, but not much. It does cut, but that that end, I put a aggressive edge on that on on the flat end, and because it's pretty thin, uh, it wasn't as good at that as I thought it would be. So I might round that off a little bit and just use it literally to get my angle cut. But just it, it's it's put it down. That's it, and then it's back in the tool. Toolbox. <laughs> Thank you.
the group do wood burning, and uh, I've I found a wood burner at a garage sale and tried it out and had some fun with it. And then I decided to make my own wood burning tool. And you might ask, why would you make your own wood burning pen? And I'd say, why not? <laughs> There's several uh, 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 videos on YouTube on how to do it. I turned the the handle, hollowed it out a little bit, uh, uh, made the electronics, soldered the, the terminals here to the wire inside, and then used JB Weld to uh, uh, hold the, uh, the little post into the wood. And uh, then I started making my own wood burning tips. There was a guy at the symposium that uh, uh, had some and he was using pieces of brass that he had run the wires through and this is a little uh, six-pointed star and so when you do the wood burning it makes that design into the wood and I've got a whole 15 or 20 or 30 in a box at home but I brought a few in this is a, a, a wood screw a brass wood screw that I ran the, the wire through and you know it gives an odd design and there's spirals and different things and uh, I've got wood burning pins that, that it, like I say, that I started out with that were purchased and manufactured commercially. And since I've done this, I bought some more. But the, the homemade ones work as good as any. Several of the people have saw my tops in the uh, uh, the box in there going to the uh, Ronald McDonald house and liked the textures that I did and wondered how I did them. Uh, using the, this is the Sorby commercial texture and you push in this way and the little uh, wheel spins. And I couldn't get the design that I saw people getting on the internet. And I watched the uh, YouTube videos again. I watched Sorby's um, uh, videos that they, showed on how to use it. I think Nick Agar was sort of the guru of it. And when I watched it, what he did, they would face the uh, end of the wood off, had complete access to it, and were able to come straight in as the, and, and then put the, the cutter up, uh, up against the wood at that angle, and you got a real nice, almost a reptile skin uh, uh, looking texture. But when you're doing a top, the way the headstock gets in the way, you're not able to, to get that square on uh, a dressing of the wood and I tried to figure out a way to make that work so I took one of the Sorby uh, wheels uh, and then put it into a little rod here and I've got this mounted at home in a, in a great big handle which I left at home because it's heavy but I'm able to go in uh, uh, and, and get to the surface of the top I'm trying to texture in the same way that they were able to get when they were uh, you know just had complete access to it with the uh, uh, tailstock pulled away so when able I'm, do, I'm able to get that texture and uh, it, it you know works for me, and people seem to like the textures that I've done. And then I've got a couple of homemade tools here. I'll set them out over on the uh, one's a beating tool and one's a tornado tool, and you can look at them at the break. When I started turning been many years ago, uh, there was a guy by the name of uh, Bob Roseanne. He made ornaments famous. And uh, when we first started Northland Wood Turners up north, we used to have uh, yearly symposiums. And one year I, I bought a class from John Shackelford. And some of you are going to remember John. And uh, so one of the things I learned at his class was to uh, make ornaments. Well, his good friend Pete Stiglitz had made him a small little skew with an interchangeable handle and it looked like a one-way handle so I hit Pete up to make me one and he said no. I said okay. So I went home and I made my own. It's not interchangeable but it works and a uh, piece of mesquite and a piece of uh, 
just a quarter inch round stock and what John showed me to do is uh, when you're making your I don't know if you can see this kind of small okay well anyway I found this one laying on my table today when I was getting a little tool out and this is one I had made several years ago and it's just been laying there for whatever reason and uh, you would have teardrops and uh, you'd use a you'd use this with your fingers like so and go down and make your teardrops and that's the first cue I ever learned how to use and I didn't know you were supposed to be scared of them so I still use them today but uh, anyway this is a type of ornament that uh, Bob Roseanne was making uh, this is a shorter one because he I think he made four or five teardrops this one has three but I made those also but uh, anyway I just thought uh, brought back a lot of old memories Virgil was there that day. I took the class from John, John's house, and uh, a lot of you probably still remember those days. So, just something, something different, and it works. You know, it's it's sharp, it cuts. So, One of the things I always had a problem with was trying to use the jig that comes with the Wolverine um, sharpening system. It was always a problem to know whether you had it straight in or not once you passed the point where the, where the clamp came down on the flutes. And the first thing I did was I took it to the machine shop and they flattened out the round part of it right the way the flutes are. That way when it got to the point where you couldn't clamp down on it, clamp down on this flat part. Well, <coughs> finally got to the point where you couldn't clamp down on this part either. Because it, you've got to leave two inches out on the end of it. So what I finally did was you either throw them away or you find a handle they'll fit in. Well, there's a lot of handles that are made. I didn't want to spend any money on it. <laughs> I think I got three dollars in this. It goes in one end of it, tightens down with a quarter twenty set screw. The other end you can put this in. And if you carry them back and forth, you just put it back inside all together. I got three or four other handles made the same way as this. It's made out of it's made out of thick wall tubing, actually, so that you've got room to put the set screw in. And then this part's just an ace bandage wrapped around it because it's easier to hold. Well, I cheated. I didn't make this tool, obviously, but uh, there's a reason I want to show it. 
Um, years ago, I took a, a class with Ray Key, and at the time I knew I was one tool away from greatness, so I bought his scraper. Now, I, I, I've purchased about 50 tools since then, and sooner or later I'm going to hit the right one. But, but um, what's unique about this tool, you can use either side, so you can use it for the inside of a bowl or the outside of a bowl. And I used it on the platters I made. I brought two platters, and uh, it takes the place of the 80-grit sandpaper. One of my platters is a little bit smaller, and I use this instead of the 80-grit sandpaper. The bigger platter, however, has a knot out toward the outer rim, and when it hit that knot, it would start to leave chatter marks. So I used the 80-grit sandpaper, Anthony, but then it took me twice as long to try to get the 80-grit sanding marks out of that walnut. So I prefer to use this, but sometimes it'll chatter if you've got especially something out towards the rim that'll make it do so, but it's a great tool because uh, you can do go inside or outside with the, with the one scraper. So I wanted to show that. It was developed by Ray Key and it was handmade by Henry Taylor. So there you go. And I don't know where the thing is. Is it behind me? People keep moving the holder. I'm Kevin Neely. I've been turning hollow turnings for a long time. I think just about everything I make is a hollow turning. And to make hollow turning successfully, you have to be able to measure wall thickness accurately. So over the years, I've, I haven't bought too many wall thickness measuring devices, but I've, I've made a lot. The very first one I made looked like this. It was a caliper. And you can see that, uh, that it's graduated, so I can see. Uh, what the thickness is, but it works really well underneath the lip of hollow turnings for about five inches down. And then I made a, a longer one for deeper, weir more weirdly shaped hollow turnings, and I've made them for real, real long vases, tall vases that, that are almost two feet long, but they don't cost anything to make. They're, they're real cheap to make. Then about uh, two years ago, I saw this thing on, at Woodcraft called the Gadget, and it was a spring um, plunger caliper. It's a, maybe you all seen them. The, the gadget looks a lot like this. It has a brass plunger that has a spring on it. And y you measure wall thickness between the two uh, rounded pieces right here. And you, what it, the very end of it, is a graduated stem, so you can just look and see that my thumb is three-eighths of an inch thick. It's real easy to, to use. And like the other kind of calipers, you can uh, put it inside the bowl and sweep it uh, from the, the, the distance uh, that you want to measure, and you can see how the, the plunger moves in and out and measure it as you go. So it's really handy. But there's no caliper that's perfect. There's always some kind of weirdly shaped neck or lip or, or base or something like that that you simply can't get a measurement on with any tool that you've got. So I've, I've made a few different ones. This is, this is made for a lip, a weird lip of a, a vase that has a neck on it. Just couldn't get anything in there except, except something like that. And the way I design a caliper of any type is to draw the outline of what I need to, to measure. And then I, I will draw the outline of the caliper and cut it out and run it over that outline on a piece of paper and just look and see if it looks like it'll actually measure anything or if it interferes somewhere. But uh, I, I have probably three or four at home still that I've used for, for specialty things. But uh, on my website, I made some instructions. If, you, if anybody ever wants to make a caliper, one of these spring calipers like a gadget, I have instructions on how I made my first one. And uh, if you get with me, I'll tell you how to download it off my website. But they're not that hard to make. The calipers, if you go buy one, they're probably 50, 60 bucks. And if you make them, they're, they're 10, 5 or $10. And the spring is 
a dollar fifty. That's the most pricey thing in it. So I guess that's about it. Uh, you, you can make your own calipers and do a good job. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's I mean, okay, there's, he's really talented. I mean, tons of stuff that, you know, he could be bringing that would be knock your socks off. Anyway, let's get to the announcements real quickly. Back here. Anyway, a round of applause for everybody that had the courage to get up here and show their homemade tools. Hey, thank you. Okay. Um, the challenge for next month is going to be